Oh, we are going through Romans. We just finished Romans 8 last week. We are into Romans 9. We get to Romans 9. And let me just ask you, have you ever come to a passage of Scripture that you truly struggled to, to understand? You're like, oh man, this is hard. What in the world am I supposed to get from this? How am I supposed to understand this? In fact, today's passage is one of those passages. I have labored over this text. I have prayed over this text. I have read about this text, watched about this text from other people. I've, I've consulted with other preachers about this text all week. I have gone to the point of exhaustion and frustration over this text. So I pray this morning that what is brought forth is aligned with God's will, and I also pray that it is coherent to you, that you'll be able to even understand what I'm saying, because it is probably going to be broken up, messed up, and not very polished this morning. So just keep that in your prayers. Now, as we go to Romans 9 here in just a second, we're going to look at some of it. I can't read all of it. We're going to do all of it today, but I can't read all of it today. But... This text, it seems to be in direct conflict with other scriptures. And at least at first glance, it feels contrary to God's character. Uh, the other scriptures I'm talking about, John 3, 16, we all know that one. This one says, for this is how God loved the world. He gave His one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. Whoever believes, everyone who believes. Matthew 11, 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all of you. Come to me. Mark 8, verse 34. Then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. If any of you wants to be my follower. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord isn't really being slow about His promise as some people think. No, He is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. He does not want anyone to be destroyed. He wants everyone to come to repentance. I could go on and on and on and on and on with these kind of texts to the point that you might be saying, what are you talking about? But God's offer is open to anyone in everyone. It is a call to abandon our self-governed life, which always leads to sin, and accept Jesus as Lord of our lives and to follow Him. But then you come to Romans chapter 9, and I want you to listen to what Paul says right here, smack dab in the middle of this text. Verses 17 through 24. For the Scripture says that God told Pharaoh, I have appointed you for the very purpose of displaying my power in you and to spread my fame throughout the earth. You see, God chooses to show mercy to some and He chooses to harden the hearts of others so they refuse to listen. Well, then you might say, why does God blame people for not responding? Haven't they simply done what He makes them do? No, don't say that. Why are you a mere, or excuse me, who are you a mere human being to argue with God? Should the thing that was created say to the one who created it, why have you made me like this? When a potter makes clay, makes jars out of clay, doesn't he have the right to use the same lump of clay to make one jar for de decoration and another to throw garbage into? In the same way, even though God has the right to show his anger and his power, he is very patient with those on whom his anger falls who are destined for destruction. He does this to make the riches of his glory shine even brighter on those to whom he shows mercy, who were prepared in advance for, the, for glory. And we are among those whom he selected, both from the Jews and from the Gentiles. Now, I don't know about you, I read that text, I'm like, wait a minute. I'm looking through Scripture it says anyone who wants to come, everyone who will repent, all who will follow me, all who need, who need rest, come to me over and over and over. God is slow so that he gives them the opportunity to repent. And then we get to Romans 9, and it almost sounds as if there's no choice. You have no choice. 
You've been pre-programmed to follow a script. You've been pre-programmed, predestined to go to heaven or hell. Predestined to choose God or choose not to follow God. And the truth is, you get to this text and there's scholar after scholar after scholar after scholar who has wrestled with this text. A.W. Tozer trying to attempt to reconcile the seemingly contradictory beliefs of God's sovereignty and man's free will says this. He says, an ocean liner leaves New York bound for Liverpool. Its destination has been determined by proper authorities. Nothing can change it. This is at least a faint picture of sovereignty. On board the liner are scores of passengers. They are not in chains. Neither are their activities determined for them by decree. They are completely free to move about as they will. They eat, sleep, play, lounge on the deck, read, talk, all together as they please. But all the while, the great liner is carrying them steadily onward toward a predetermined port. Both freedom and sovereignty are present here, and they do not contradict. So it is, I believe, with man's freedom and the sovereignty of God, the mighty liner of God's sovereign design keeps its steady course over the sea of history. A.W. Tozer tries to explain how God can have sovereignty and we can have free will. But he's not the only one who tries to explain it. Even Hollywood has taken up this mantra and have made movies trying to explain it, although I'm not going to them as my experts, but they do go. You remember the, the Truman Show? Truman Burbank played by Jim Carrey? His whole life has been planned out for him. His entire life is, is set up and people are watching it as a TV program. Millions of people around the world watch his life take place. And finally, the, the, the last straw drops. His mind is open. It's sent into turmoil. And he desperately tries to escape this phony existence that has been pre-planned for him. Or we remember a man by the name of Neo. He is in the, the Matrix. Remember, he swallowed the, the red pill. And all of a sudden, his eyes were open to the reality. Human experience is a simulated uh, reality. Human beings are just energy sources for machines. And so Neo takes up the fight of, uh, uh, of trying to break free from the machines. There's also the Adjustment Bureau. Congressman David Norris, played by Matt Damon, bristles at the idea that the relationship with the only woman he has ever really loved must end because it was not part of a predetermined plan. So he, he, but he won't stand for it. He promptly decides he's going to fight the destiny that has been applied to him. He is going to fight with his own love-struck willpower. Even a new movie, uh, Free Guy, talking about the same thing. The thought of being mere puppets in someone else's show or mere pawns to be moved around a chessboard is outrageous to us. It doesn't make any sense to us. So what are we to do with this chapter? By the way, there are some other statements in this chapter that kind of allude to this as well. And I didn't have time to talk about every single one of them. This sermon's already an hour and a half long. So, so I, was, I was like, shoo! But it was predetermined to be that way. So you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about it. So what is the context? That's what we have to look at this text. In fact, every text you come to in the Bible, you have to ask yourself, what is the context? But especially in those texts that seem to kind of, you're like, I don't understand this. Then you really have to look at the original context. And you, when you look at, at these scriptures, you need to recognize that they were spoken to a group of people for a specific purpose. And they have meaning for us too, I understand that. But we also need to recognize that as we look at them, that sometimes we might be missing the meaning because we don't see it from their context. We don't recognize it from their point of view. And so what you need to understand about Romans chapter 9 as we set this all up is that Paul is anticipating as he's writing Romans. He anticipates 
the Jews having questions. He, he's been telling them, hey, the, the Gentiles are allowed in. The Greeks are allowed in. Everyone's allowed in who has faith in God. They just need to live for the Lord. He's been saying this throughout the letter. And then he gets to this chapter and he says, I know that some of my Jewish brethren are going to have some problems here because they thought they were the chosen people. They thought they were in on their heritage. They thought they had it all wrapped up. And so he, he, he responds to these questions that he knows are coming. Uh, why hasn't God kept His promise? They might have asked. Uh, we're the chosen people. We're God's people. We're, we're the people of the promise. Why are you saying that other people are a part of that now as well? And so Paul addresses those concerns. Now, if you're going to address a Jew on Jewish concerns, where will you usually take your address from? Well, you're going to take it from the Old Testament Scriptures which is what they would be familiar with. So you're talking to the Jews. You're addressing a Jewish question that you know is going to come up. And so you address it by using Old Testament Scriptures. And that's what Paul does throughout the entire chapter. He's quoting or referencing Old, Old Testament Scripture over and over and over again. Whole chapter, Old Testament Scripture, Old Testament Scripture, Old Testament Scripture. He's quoting them over and over and over again. Now, as we look at Paul's answer, I think... In his answering their question, he also provides us a way of approaching others as well, especially those who are struggling. So I want to start at the first of the chapter, look at a few verses here. Verses 1 through 3, chapter 9. This is what it says. With Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people. My Jewish brothers and sisters, I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ if that would save them. The very first thing Paul says is, I love you so, so much. I just want you to understand. Yes, you're struggling to understand what I've said. Yes, it doesn't make sense to you. I'm going to try to address it for you, but I want you to start off by understanding I love you, I love you, I love you. By the way, isn't that so important when we're talking to other people? <laughs> Listen, we, we have a difference of opinion. You don't understand it like I understand it. We're going to search God's Word. We're going to look at Scripture. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to lead us in our understanding. But I love you. I love you. I love you. Isn't that exactly what Jesus did? In fact, Paul says, essentially, I want to do what Jesus did. If, if I could be cursed so that you could be saved, I'd do it. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that's what Jesus does. But God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Not once we got things ready. Not once we got a little bit better. Not once we started looking good. Not once we said, hey, I'm in. It's when we were still sinners. Actually, chapter 10 goes on to talk about while we were still enemies. Enemies. Sinners of Christ. So when discussing divisive issues, I just want you to understand, this is always a good place to start. I love you. I love you. Now, it's important to actually love them if you're going to say you love them. So love them. Don't just say it, but love them. That's the first thing. Second thing as we go through this text, remember, he's answering their questions. And the first question they really have, and really kind of over, is the entire uh, encompassing of this chapter is, has God failed us? And, and Paul says God hasn't failed to keep his promises. He hasn't failed to keep his promises. Paul goes on to clear up some misunderstandings, some misconceptions that have been going on for centuries in their world. God hasn't accepted you because of your birthright, he says, but because of your faith in Him. They had misunderstood. They thought, hey, I, as a, as a Hebrew, have been, have been chosen for salvation and, and I'm in no matter what. And the truth is they messed it right from the get-go. They were not chosen for salvation. They were chosen for service which would lead to salvation. I understand that. But, but he goes and he says, that's not right. You're wrong. You misunderstand. Verses 6 through 8. Well then, has God failed to fulfill His promise to Israel? No. For not all who are born into the nation of Israel are truly members of God's people. Being descendants of Abraham doesn't make them truly Abraham's children. For the Scripture says, Isaac is the son through whom the, your descendants will be counted. Though Abraham had other children too. This means that Abraham's physical descendants are not necessarily children of God. 
Only the children of the promise are considered to be Abraham's children. You might be looking at that, wait a minute. I thought all of them were God's children. Well, Paul says, no, you misunderstood. Not all of you are God's children. By the way, he's already said this in Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, he says it like this. He says, a person is not a Jew who is, only, who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. He goes on. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. Do you understand what Paul said in the beginning? He said, listen, Jewishness, the real Israel, is not a heritage issue. It is those who are acting in faith, following Jesus, and being transformed by the Spirit. That's, that's them. That's them. Now, here's where we get to the real question. So he starts down, I love you, I love you, I love you. God has not failed you in your promises. If you're, if you're faithful to him, if you're following him, if you're walking in faith with him, you receive them. So he's not, he's not unfaithful. Just recognize that. He's keeping his promise. But here we get to the crux. Here we get to the crux. Romans 9, verse 14, and here's what he says. Are we saying then that God is unfair? And Paul says, of course not. That's what they were saying. Is God unfair? Is it God being unfair? God said we're his people, and now he's saying we're not really his people? Isn't that unfair? Well, he's already kind of cleared that up. He said, wait a minute, you misunderstood. You didn't understand what God was saying. Now, interestingly enough, Paul quickly says to that question, he says, of course not. The answer is absolutely not. No way, Jose, God is never unfair. In fact, it goes on real quickly right after that to reference Moses. Now, he doesn't say all this in the Scripture, but as you look at the Scripture, he's bringing their minds back to when Moses comes down off the mountain. Remember when Moses comes down off the mountain the first time with God's Scriptures? You know, I mean, God's commandments, I should say. And, and, and what does he find the people doing? They're worshiping a golden calf. What could have God done at that moment? <laughs> done. They, don't, they couldn't even make it a couple of months. Gone. I'm starting anew. Moses, you're going to have more kids, buddy. <laughs> you're already a little over 80, but I got you taken care of. I got you covered. God doesn't do that. God could have done that. That would have been right and justified. But God shows mercy. And that's what he says. God showed mercy. God didn't wipe them out. God didn't wipe them out. He spared the nation. He spared them. Then he goes on and you say to yourself, well, what, what about this hardening of Pharaoh's heart? How are we supposed to understand that? Sounds like God was active in that. Well, if you look at Exodus, interestingly enough, as you go through Exodus, you go through the plagues, you recognize that Pharaoh hardens his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Then it says, God hardened his heart. God hardened his heart. God hardened his heart. Pharaoh started the process and what did God do? Picked it up. Kept going with it. Now, you might say, well, that doesn't seem exactly fair. Well, Exodus chapter 9, verse 16. But I have spared you, talking to Pharaoh, for a purpose, to show you my power and to spread my fame throughout the earth. Now, here's the interesting thing about that. I have spared you, God says about Pharaoh. I have spared you. Meaning, you deserve not to be spared. I could have just wiped you out. I didn't do that. I gave you more time. I gave you more time. I gave you more time. And because you decided to harden your heart, I let you. In fact, Paul's addressed this. Romans chapter 1. He's already addressed it. Romans chapter 1, verse 24, 26, 28. I'm going to read them all to you. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things they, their hearts desire. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. Verse 26. This is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against their nat the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. Verse 28. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, He abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. God, God did harden hearts. 
Because he essentially said, hey, you're rejecting me? You're pushing against me? I've been trying to say, no, go this way. No, go this way. No, go this Come back. Come back. You keep going. You keep going. You keep going. And I finally say, okay. And I pull back. Whatever was keeping you, and you just, you're in the, you're in the wave. You're in the, the rushing flow of where your sinful desires are taking you. And there you go. All right, Todd. Maybe I can deal with the, the hardened heart thing. Maybe I can deal with the, not, not, you know, God's not unfair, but there's just no way of getting around this clay thing, this potter in the clay. That is, there is no way of looking at this and not saying that God predetermined some people to be saved and some people to be lost. It's just an impossibility. But I have asked you already, isn't this text supposed to be looked at in its original context? So if... We look at it in its original context. We have to understand Paul has been referring to Old Testament Scripture. Paul has been looking back at Old Testament Scripture. Paul has been pointing them back to their history. And he does it again. And he quotes here a Jewish text. He's quoting Jeremiah chapter 18. I'm going to read it to you because if I do not read it to you, you're not going to understand it as we should. Jeremiah 18 verses 1 through 10. This is what it says. The Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, go down to the potter's shop and I'll speak to you there. So I did as he told me. And I found the potter working at his wheel. But the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. So he crushed it into a lump of clay again and started over. Then the Lord gave me this message. O oh, Israel... Can I not do to you as this potter has done to this clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. If I announce that a certain nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, but then that nation renounces its evil ways, I will not destroy it as I have planned. And if I announce that I will plant and build up a certain nation or kingdom, but then that nation turns to evil and refuses to obey me. I will not bless it as I said I would. Now, there's some simple things about this potter's will we need to understand. Who is forming the clay? The potter. The potter is forming the clay. The potter's involved with that. Who determines how the vessel is formed? Now, this is a trick question. I, I, I'm tricking you. Don't answer yet. Because the truth is, the clay decides how it's being formed. The clay. Now you're like, whoa! The potter decides. No! The potter does not decide in this text. The clay decides. The clay decides. In fact, when Jeremiah sees the actual potter doing his work, the, what he was trying to form didn't happen. And so he had to scrap it and start all over again. Why? Because the clay didn't uh, work with the potter. It just didn't, didn't work with the potter. The clay determines how it's going to be formed. God says to Jeremiah, the action of the clay determines the action of the potter. That's what he says. He says, hey, I might say that I'm going to destroy this nation, this people, these group of, these group of peoples because they're doing evil. But if they turn around, I'll relent. I'm not going to do that. Or I might say I bless this nation and these people but if they start doing evil, I'm not going to bless them. It's the clay. He wants us to conform to what he has decided would be best for us. He has a perfect design for you and for me and all his children. But you and I, as the clay, can still resist that form. And then he forms us into what we desire. A garbage disposal. Well, This is what you want, right? I've been trying to make you this. You could be this beautiful vase in the service of the king. Nope. I want to be a trash can. If you could make me a trash can, please. Michelangelo has some pretty important quotes. By the way, Michelangelo, in case you do not know who he is, because schools may not teach about him anymore, I don't know, but he is probably the world's greatest sculptor. And he had these two famous quotes. First quote, every block of stone has a statue inside it and it is the task of the sculpture to discover it. 
Second quote, I saw the angel in the marble and carved until I set him free. Michelangelo understood what we're talking about here. Paul is not proclaiming in this text that you have no choice in the matter. In fact, he is proclaiming in this text that you have all the choice in the matter. God gave us the options and we decide if we're going to surrender or we decide if we are going to bow up. By the way, one last thing. Someone would still say, Todd, I can track with your thought. I can, I can see where you're going here, but I'm still not quite sure. Well, when you're struggling with the text and you want to know what it really means, one of the best people to go to is the original writer of the text. If you go to the very last few verses of this text, Paul says this, verse 30. What does all this mean? Just gave all this stuff that we're struggling with. He says, what does all this mean? Here's what it means. Even though the Gentiles were not trying to follow God's standards, they were made right with God. And it was by faith that this took place. But the people of Israel, who tried so hard to get right with God by keeping the law, never succeeded. Why not? Because they were trying to get right with God by keeping the law instead of by trusting in Him. Paul says, if you're having trouble understanding this, let me just clear this up. Salvation comes through faith. Let me, let me clear that up. See, we all struggle to understand God. We, we, under, we, we, we cannot wrap our minds around God. We cannot wrap our minds around how He can be eternal in every single direction there ever was. We cannot quite wrap our minds around the idea that He's outside of time. And we surely can't wrap our minds around how He can be sovereign and at the same time give us free will. But He has done it because He is God. Because he is God. By the way, a little bonus tidbit here. Did you know that no one ever looked at this text and believed that it spoke about predetermined des eternities until the fourth century? Up until that point, no one ever looked at it and said, oh, well, you know, well at least we have no recorded history of anybody looking at it. Let's put it that way. Oh, this must mean uh, we're all predetermined. Nope, not till the fourth century. By the way, you know why I think that happened? Because those people closest to the text understood the context. And as you get farther and farther away, it's harder and harder and harder to understand the context of the text. So you and I have to make a choice. That's what this text is really telling us. You and I, every single one of us has to make a choice. Will we yield to the potter's design for our lives or will we demand that he makes us in our own image what we want? I want to read you one last thought from C.S. Lewis. He says, every time you make a choice, you are turning the central part of you, the part of you that chooses, into something a little different from what it was before. And taking your life as a whole with all your innumerable choices, all your life, all life, all your life long, you are slowly turning this central thing either into a heavenly creature or into a hellish creature. Either into a creature that is in harmony with God and with other creatures and with itself, or else it is one that is in the state of war and hatred with God and with its fellow creatures and with itself. To be the one kind of creature is heaven. That is, it is joy and peace and knowledge and power. To be the other means madness, horror, idiocy, rage, impotence, and eternal loneliness. Each of us, at each moment, is progressing to one state or to the other. Where are you headed? Are you allowing God to mold you? Or have you been holding back? Are you choosing to surrender? Or have you been holding back? Are you, are you choosing to say, God... You decide, and I'll stop making the decisions. What are you choosing? Because that's really what this text is asking. What are you choosing? God always keeps his promise. He's always faithful. He's never unfair, and he loves you. And so what are you choosing? What are you choosing? We pray with me.
God, I thank you for this text, even though it was extremely hard, even though I struggled terribly hard with it. And Lord, I pray that it was presented in a way that was honoring to you. And if there was something I said that was, that was wrong, Lord, I pray that you would make, make me alerted to it so that I can get that corrected. I pray for each of us here too. Uh, we, we struggle. And we, we want to follow you. And I know that you honor that as we, as we desperately try to yield to your direction in our lives. I know you honor that love. I know you honor that surrender. And so Lord, that's my prayer. My prayer is that you will help us to be more and more uh, in line with your will and look more and more like your son. And live more and more in this world as an example, as, a, as a, a goose in the midst of the cattle. Thank you, God. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your text, even though we struggle with it. Let us allow it to transform us. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.